Hi, welcome to another webinar from Ellie Publishing. I'm Andy and today we're going to look at speaking skills with teens and young adults and we're going to look at first of all how they maybe hold back a little bit and don't want to talk and then how we can do something about that and we're going to look at material from Sprint which is a four level uh, A1 to B1 course with all the bits and pieces you'd want to get those kids talking and uh, my email is there on the slide at the bottom and also at the end of this webinar and you can always email me with comments and feedback questions or links uh, that I may not be uh, showing here for some reason and the uh, the team for LE the international representatives can be contacted there at international at LE dot com and you can follow Ellie on the various social media channels. The website over is on the right hand corner. So um, why don't they speak? I mean we know that feeling you know you go in with your best lesson and yeah, they're, they're just not going to say anything they're just staring at you and uh, you open that question or you show a picture nothing. Uh, maybe I'm wrong maybe there, I mean, there are good days and bad days of course and some things you know are going to work but why don't let's let's think a bit about why don't they want to say anything and the first thing people say is oh well they're teenagers aren't they and if you think about it I know what you mean but teenagers actually talk a lot <laughs> maybe not the way you want them to but I think what we do know is um, they have a lot of energy and a, a lot of energy and a lot of things to say for themselves we'll come to that in a second but uh, I think to one extent you can say maybe they're just they're at that age where they feel self-conscious I think you know that's not their fault remember I mean they're having a pretty interesting time of change aren't they and we have to be very compassionate mindful about what it is like to be a teenager I mean come on let's remember uh, I don't think we were that keen on school or being told to speak in a foreign language so although we can get over those some of the hurdles I wouldn't push them too hard I would be kind of mindful that they you know are feeling a bit strange it's a bit weird isn't it you know you, you're 15 years old you're 14 and you you've got to turn to your your partner and talk in a foreign language and normally you're chatting every day in your own language I mean it, it, the artifice in in classroom pair work I think we have to be a, a little kind and assume um, nothing about their their sense of wanting to be involved so we've got some tools in our toolkit for that coming up uh, but we have to remember they are self-conscious they're very aware of you know being you know laughed at by their peers and their self-esteem of course is up and down isn't it all those hormones uh, raging and and then wondering you know are they liked will they be popular if they stand out will they you know be picked on and there's a lot of things going on in the classroom and you know that and uh, you can google all sorts of interesting videos and articles about teens and what makes them tick but I certainly would be constantly mindful that we were teenagers we may have struggled didn't we and we've got to do our best to kind of ride that ride that wave with them um, sometimes we have to remember they may not want to speak because they don't have the language I mean we may feel we've done a really good lesson and maybe they've filled in the workbooks beautifully but that doesn't mean they can speak and speaking is really hard in a foreign language even when you're you know you're not a beginner you've still got to think pretty quickly think of those endings think of the the adjectives and it's quite it's hard I think and you know I think when we're by the time we're teachers even young teachers we have to remember that there was a time when we were beginning to try and speak and um, the classroom situation is only a classroom situation it can't be the real thing easily so I think managing our expectations and their expectations are the way to go but do they have enough language have we really supported them to do the activity with the correct language and, and maybe we should look at that and let's also remember if, if they're not speaking and you've tried a few different things maybe your lesson isn't the right lesson maybe it's too high in level or maybe maybe they just don't like it maybe they don't know they don't know enough about it maybe they're feeling that you know well uh, I guess I know the English here and I can see what the teachers doing but we don't know enough about the subject in which case maybe it could be a flipped classroom situation where you give them some work a few lessons before or a few days before to find out more so that they are informed I mean not every lesson has to teach them new things apart from the language maybe we we want them to know as much as possible in whatever language helps them 
so that we're not testing their knowledge or teaching them new things. We just want them to express themselves in English, possibly about something that they know already. In fact, that's quite a good idea, I think. You know, when they, they know, for example, a film or um, a TV show or, you know, something that they do every day, that it's their knowledge. They know this. And we're not trying to find out new things. We're trying to see how they can talk about that in their own, in their, in their, in their foreign language, which is English in this case. And maybe we've given them a topic and they don't really have an opinion. I mean, we can't point to the students every time and say, come on, what do you think? Do you agree or disagree? And I mean, they might be self-conscious about showing their opinions or maybe they just don't have one, you know. So maybe we have to find topics or come round on topics that will give them something to really uh, talk about. And later on in the session, we're going to pick on a few things or just maybe provoke them. I mean, why not? <laughs> provoke them, I mean nicely, but you can provoke an opinion, you can come up with some things that will really spark some conversations or at least some responses. And of course, you know, you can't win all the students over all the time. They've come to a class, it's English, next hour they've got biology, they've just had maths. I mean, there's a lot against, you know, really being successful to do this. So I think this comes back to giving them manageable tasks. We'll, we'll come to a list of what we can do about this, but manageable tasks, keeping it clear, and then, you know, not expecting too much. But over time, we can build up a speaking habit with the students. And, uh, you know, this is the point where some teachers insist that all things in the classroom must be said in English by you and by them and, and that maybe works in some schools um, but I don't think it works in every class and I don't think it works in every class for every school unless you're a sort of major bilingual school where that's the rule but I could argue even if that is the school that you're in if you examine the classroom is it really working for the students do they really feel co comfortable and and full of energy to talk in English all the time that's that's a lot if it's a school where every single subject is in English, well, I guess that's different. But um, I think, you know, I've often likened this to being underwater, really. When you go underwater, you've got to hold your breath and you really want to come up for air. I think if students are, are constantly having to speak in English for 45, 50 minutes and you're only in English all the time, I guess there's a theory about language acquisition through, you know, exposure. But uh, I still think that can be quite tiring and possibly unrealistic and could make your job a lot harder. Um, and you can still give them plenty of speaking practice without insisting it's always in English because that could really frustrate them. And you don't want frustrated teenagers because you've got already an uphill battle getting them to do the task that you want. So getting them talking, I mean, I think this is a list that I you would say that if you read around, you know, motivating teenagers, uh, getting them to, to be involved. This would be a list that you generally find. They've got to be curious. I mean, how can we get them immediately, you know, paying attention to the subject? Can we show them a picture? Could you give them a provocative statement? Could you play them some music? And I'm sure you've got your ideas there. This is a webinar, so um, I'm not in a conference or workshop situation, but if I were, I would I would put it to you in the audience and say, look, what do you, what kind of little techniques do you do? You know, I think that's the great thing about, you know, being on, on Facebook or on, on teaching communities to share ideas. There must be some really fantastic things you do to get the kids curious. And once they're curious, you've got their attention. And when you've got their attention, you can start to give them the language they need. That's not, you know, that's not breaking news for anybody. But getting them curious is very important. And you need to involve them as well. That second one there, you know, if they're not involved, it's just another academic lesson. Writing things down, go away and remember it then we've got to involve them. Are your instructions clear? I mean, maybe you've got a really great activity to get them speaking, but maybe um, they just don't feel it's clear what they have to do. So maybe don't make it too involved. Um, and of course, from speaking activities, they could be very controlled ones, like very, very controlled pair work activities to just practice a structure to the more open, less controlled, free uh, speaking fluency practice where we're not involved in too much correction. We just want them to be using the language and feeling confident and building up a sort of, I suppose, a memory muscle for speaking. 
um, but make the instructions really clear and ask the students to tell you back even if it's in their own language so you know Michael what what do we have to do again could you tell us again M oh Michael you weren't paying attention <laughs> right well okay so Mary you tell Michael and the rest of us what what is it we have to do here we have to do this okay and then what okay good so everyone so don't move on until we really asked the class you know to tell you right we've got it we know what we're doing and make the outcome clear let them f know and if you don't know you should why we're doing this you know what is the point is it to express our opinions are we trying to reach a, a decision from a, a problem solving activity or you know is it um, just for practice but in a situation where we're practicing functions like you know, ordering food in a restaurant or buying tickets for travel you know the outcome why are we doing this the last thing that you would want would be for the students to think we're just doing this because we're in a class and that's what the teachers telling us I mean that's kind of true but can we can we do anything else to really make it um, a realistic and, and purposeful outcome rapport now by that what I mean is you know if you're a teacher that's very authoritarian authoritarian and you you say right number two let's start speaking you speak to him and you okay you know we need to uh, uh, let's hope we're building up a good classroom environment I mean you probably are but are you building up a rapport with your students where they feel comfortable talking to each other and talking to you maybe some of the the group work is is is, is talking back to you uh, as a plenary as, as just a group a group chat um, if the if you're not passionate about the subject or you're you, you don't make them feel relaxed or you feel that they are they afraid of you in some way how can you kind of soften the environment how can you make them feel comfortable but it's got to feel relevant you know and eventually sooner or later the topic has got to be personalized it's all very well talking about the environment or fashion or food but of course you'll find in sprint this material we'll look at later and all materials and your own lessons have to be geared towards what what's in it for me the most popular topic in the curriculum across every country in English language teaching is yourself myself me especially teenagers it's just about their world so all right fashion food environment what about me what about my world and we've got to make it hand over the topic and the language for them and when it's personalized it becomes more meaningful they need the language to do it are you giving them enough language have they really understood the lesson did you have should you go back over it before they start speaking it may feel like the right thing to do to go into a speaking activity but if they're not ready let's not do it let's go back and check this is all about supporting them and of course knowing enough about the subject or the topic to even talk about it at all so make the goals clear and make the instructions clear and make the task meaningful and purposeful you know let's not make it something academic because the course book tells us to what could you do how could you find some things online or some pictures or videos we'll, we'll do some of that too today you know to bring life bring a new dimension to the course book the, the sprint co the sprint course has all sorts of lovely digital video components and things but what can you do and what can they do to go outside the classroom literally and virtually to bring things to that topic to do whatever you can do to make it real and I know it's hard and it takes preparation but you know that it's worth it I think you know the teachers books for this for this course and other courses I've seen it early are fantastic but at the end of the day you've still got to tailor make it to your to your students haven't you and that means collaborating with them saying hey guys we're doing something tomorrow on cinema who knows some good good blogs about I you got a good blog okay you bring the link in tomorrow who it's a good video clip okay bring that in so what's your favorite trailer you know and let them bring the material to you you know you're planning ahead you know what's coming up in the weeks ahead work together and I think that also builds the rapport with your students so personalizing it and supporting them enough language enough knowledge and not correcting them too much really we know there's a, there's a time and place for correcting our students and if we're always jumping on them every mistake we're only going to do that really if we're seeing if they've understood and could correctly use the grammar you've been teaching maybe but really for fluency practice we just want to keep them going and of course with pair work or little little groups of three chatting in certain controlled 
activities you can go around monitoring and uh, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a perfect situation but you do have to make sure that everyone's got a chance to speak rather than just one person at a time and that's going to be you know kind of dull and also stressful for those who are speaking on their own and that's why I'm not so keen on reading aloud as a speaking activity if you get students to read aloud um, well, I don't think it really helps their pronunciation. Um, they feel nervous, so it's not their best possible performance. Uh, and um, I think if we think about it, reading out loud uh, is not something that we ever do in life unless you're a teacher or a religious leader or a politician. And even those people like you, a teacher, if you were asked to read out loud to an audience, how would you feel? And if you did have to do it, you prepare first so if you must ask your students to read out loud and you think it's a speaking activity I'm doubtful that it's actually really realistic in the real world or even a good way to make them feel comfortable about speaking but um, people can disagree with me there but examine whether reading aloud really works for all of your students not just the ones who are confident let's see but uh, support them make them feel comfortable and monitor them and see you know where individual students may need more help now in sprint you have a, a four level course which goes from a1 to b1 and we're going to look at some ideas and how we can get them talking with the topics and the activities that come up in sprint uh, from the list yet there you can see some of the main features of the course that you would see obviously a full curriculum of grammar and integrated skills but there is an emphasis in the course on communication which is why I've chosen speaking skills today using the language in as many meaningful contexts as possible and very teen centered so all the topics are very much geared towards not just the sort of things that teenagers like, you know, music and food and fashion and whatever, but also real teenagers and characters and videos in the course itself to see real kids talking about it. So the, the, your, your students can identify easily with the material and the kids that are in the material. Uh, 21st century skills, particularly critical thinking, comes up uh, from time to time throughout the units and as you often find in LE Publishing's materials, whether they're readers or whether they are the different ages and levels of course books, culture and other subjects in English occur all the time and that's brilliant because that's exactly what we need. CLIL, if you're not familiar with that term, is content and language integrated learning. CLIL, that's where you have the language and also a subject from the curriculum like maths or science or geography, biology and you take some of the language, the meta language from those uh, subjects and the students are talking or speaking or writing or reading about that particular topic and of course that makes a lot of sense you know you, from 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 an early time in the morning until the afternoon the students spend every day five days a week sometimes six working amongst different topics and different um, interdisciplinary subjects and why not use those in our English curriculum that's meaningful that's purposeful and later they could well to go go on to study in English and need basic study skills so instead of just reading about day-to-day -day topics it's really valuable and more and more so that students encounter and start to read about and communicate with the content and language integrated so that's CLIL. Quickly the components for Sprint and uh, you can go online to the website at Ellie that's elleonline.com and you can see that there's a student's book, workbook, teacher's book with various uh, components and resources there. I particularly like the multi-ROM which is a test maker that means that you've got a, a disk there where you can see different te tests uh, on Word and you can adapt those texts to become tests there's a nice little tongue twister for you uh, and then you can adapt those and print them out so there's different kinds of revision and worksheet tests and the book is digital you put a code into uh, the website and you can contact us for more details there and then you can activate your digital book and then you can have all the different audio visual elements that go with it and we'll look at some of those videos too um, the four levels each have eight units and there are ten pages in a unit so you've got a full a full uh, balanced diet of grammar and skills and all sorts of different components to work with there and um, you have 
uh, a double language input so similar to other courses at this age group Ellie will give you uh, reading and uh, audio sort of dialogue input to introduce the language and, and get the theme working activate the vocabulary and take the skills from there uh, and then there are competences which is when we talk about CLIL so the other subjects from the curriculum brought into your English classroom here culture and festivals features and not just the English speaking world but other countries um, where English is spoken but perhaps not as a mother tongue and that's an opportunity for students to compare festivals traditions values different from their own which is a, a really important skill as we teach young learners and young adults to go out into the world not believing that their way is the only way but their way is one of many ways and uh, diversity and tolerance was never more important and where are they going to learn that kind of thing I mean are they going to learn that in all the other lessons in the curriculum I, I think English if we keep remembering that it's not a subject it's not just a language it's a communication skill and communicating in English is going to involve working or communicating somehow internationally uh, even if it's just social media or it could be, it could be video calls it could be uh, gaming online which is what a lot of teenagers do and a, a lot of that's in English and when you do that even if people have great English it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to all get on well or even agree uh, because you may come from a different viewpoint because of your culture so I think it's really important that books like Sprint do cover cultural as aspects and, uh, and that's not new I think most teachers are aware of this but you, where are you going to find the material and if you look at uh, some of the examples today we can see how to make the most of that and in this particular topic get those students talking videos are a great way of doing that there's drama readers in the first um, first two levels and in the word bank in the first two levels there are nice little picture dictionaries which you can use but I would put up a picture you know and the kids come into the class they could be settling down and throwing things about and talking and then they might just see this picture when they come in right and I think we know that a visual of some sort is going to get the attention and they could be settling down and you're doing nothing you're just waiting to let them get ready and they'll be looking at this board your whiteboard maybe or even just a big picture you've printed out this comes from um, Sprint there you go just a quick glance at the unit but there's a typical unit nice design lots of things going on you can see some you know some uh, speaking and writing some warm-ups okay we'll come back to that but th I've just taken the picture and you can ask the students to hey, what's going on here you know is he happy and who is, what is it oh they're a family really what's he doing he's eating is he eating maybe What's she doing? Sister, friend, whatever. She's cleaning. Oh, so is what, he's cleaning too. Right, so you're eliciting from the picture. Uh, look at the parents. I like that. <laughs> so, it's quite a message, isn't it? You know, what are the parents doing? Nothing. So I quickly want to kind of, you know, poke, poke my audience, poke my teenager's audience to sort of realize that what's going on here. If we were in a group now together, you'd be shouting ideas, I hope. What we'd get is a situation where the kids are doing their chores, all right, and the parents are going, hmm, you see, I'm going to get my kids to do it because you've got to learn to do your chores. And then what do you do next? Well, you would, I guess, you could elicit from the group, let's brainstorm, give them a few minutes. Um, English or your local language, I don't care. What I want at this point is to get them activated with the topic. They're not going to talk about it until they've got the language. So I want to brainstorm the different chores. But instead of just asking them by showing them like a unit where they're starting to look all over the page and think, oh my goodness, there's a lot of work we're going, <laughs> we're going to do today. Picture, what's happening? Chores, right, guys, I want, who's got 10? 10, first person to get 10. 10 get a sticker whatever your rewards are anyway brainstorm all the, the different chores doing the dishes cleaning the floor cleaning windows or he's cleaning up cleaning the table you know clearing up after dinner and then you could do all sorts with that let's see in the book um, they that's pair work to sort of do the same kind of brainstorming and then they have to order uh, some of the uh, worst chores, the ones they'd rather do, or the ones that they, they have to do at home. So lots of opportunity there to, to explore that topic. Um, this is obviously something to do with housework in the USA, and there's some listing there to, to see how a particular uh, teenager 
does his chores and how he feels about them. Um, let's take a closer look here. In the pair work there, you ask each other the following questions about the habits of your family. Okay, so back to personalizing it. And uh, they've got to have an opinion about this. I mean, you know, everybody hates it. And everyone would have a preference if they had to do one chore over another. Would you rather wash the car or would you rather put out the bin and scrape away all the food? Whatever. And then they've got habits and, and chores there and you've got writing. But I often think with writing activities, so if you write an email to a foreign friend, tell him about a typical family life in your country. But I could make that into a speaking activity. You don't have to make that writing. Um, you could make it a you could make a scripted Skype call or a video call on WhatsApp. So instead of writing an email there, I would adapt that perhaps and then make with my partner they have to create a little chat or maybe some prompts uh, if they have a if it's a confident a strong class, maybe they could do a sort of pretend uh, call with each other um over a video call or a phone call to just to talk about their chores oh what have you what have you got to do tonight oh i've got to I've got a hoover I've got to hoover the stairs I've got to do the dusting you know so I think what I'm saying is, you know, Sprint here is giving you lots of ideas, but we don't have to stick with just, not just the, the same order of the task, but we can actually adapt them any way we see fit. I love this. In Sprint, you've got this thing called Kids at Work, if you see that. And it says here, Video Sprint. Interview a member of your family. Ask how many hours they dedicate to work, how many to domestic chores and how many to leisure and then sprint ahead research the chores that children performed in your country in the past I mean there's quite a lot going on there and earlier in the unit there are things about you know kids in the past and what they had to do but taking the kids some smartphones and asking them to, to go home and do some interviews now those interviews could be in English I suppose um, if the parents have some English that could be a good way to connect your school uh, work with with home. That's something we're always trying to do, isn't it? Um, or you could, they they could do it in a, in their local language, and then they could sort of play it back to the class and translate it like they're interpreting, you know. So they could do, um, you know, hey dad, what what chores do you do? Well, you know, son, I do all the chores in this house. Your mother does nothing, you know joking we'll come to this in a second and then they could maybe translate it or if they have English in the in the house they could try that too um, and if if the parents make mistakes then you could get the class to correct the mistakes I mean it doesn't matter does it the main thing is we want them involved as much as possible and here's a great way to do it now I'm aware that some schools have strict rules about mobile phones um, and, and having them brought in but maybe they could record things and send you the videos to play there's always ways around it and if you need some help on using mobile phones inside and outside the classroom email me happy to help email is at the end of the session here we go. Here's a few characters here. You can do some reading here. Chloe, Grace, who's 14. You see the age group here for Sprint Sprint users. Joey, who's 16. Wayne. Look at Wayne here. We have constant arguments at home about chores. Surely not. Our parents ask, whose turn is it to load or unload the washing machine? My brother and I shout, yours! <laughs> surprise, surprise. And our parents say, it's certainly not theirs. So we do all together. What a happy house. Household chores. Come on, what a great topic. I, you know, um, what I did here, this is this is a little picture I found online. This is not in Sprint, uh, but th all these things you've seen so far, they are in Sprint, all right? But then you, I think, think widely on the topic. You know, you're preparing your lesson. You're thinking about chores. Think, you know, what would make this really lively, interesting, global, uh, thought-provoking? And I thought, infographics. This is an infographic, in a way. It's a simple one. Because not only do we have a thing, we th we have a thing about chores. We don't like to do them. Some people do. I know some people who actually like ironing, uh, and they have they run their own business because we don't like ironing, so we send it to them. But you burn calories. We know this. Housework keeps you fit. In fact, because we do less housework than maybe 50 years ago, because we now have labour-saving devices and technology. That's why we're all getting fatter. We should do more homework, uh, housework and homework. So look at that. You, it, now, I don't know if it's true, okay, which is another thing about the internet. One person finds one infographic, another student finds another, and they can compare facts. That can't be true, you know? So at least they're saying something. 90 calories if you scrub the shower for 15 minutes. 
That's not bad, is it? Uh, redecorating. Moving furniture. Oh, yeah. 100 plus calories. If you move furniture for 15 minutes. Okay, so it could cause some problems at home there. 153 calories if you mop for an hour. So, teachers, get mopping. <laughs> Who mops for an hour? Anyway, what I like about this picture, it's, it's non-gender. Look at these little pink characters. But then I thought, hmm, why don't we wind up the students? Now, here's a warning. I'm going to play you a video here. So, yeah, I thought, there must be some videos out there about chores. And then I thought, if I want to get them speaking, I want to really wind them up with something provocative. Now, forgive me uh, out there if you think that I believe in this video. I don't. But if you go back into the 50s and 60s, uh, films on YouTube, you can find some very very interesting things to talk about. Because uh, here, I'm just going to flip my screen, I hope, here to um, play this uh, clip on women and housework in the past. Now, let's just watch it and see if I can show you what I mean by making it into a speaking activity. Let's play it now, okay? Here's to the ladies, the fair and the weak. Fair they are, we'll all admit. But who dares call them weak? Our modern girls play as hard and with as much vitality and stamina as any man. How do they do it? Where do they find all that energy, that seemingly inexhaustible store of pep and ginger? Is that whipcord resilience that lets the weaker sex play half the night, then bob up clear-eyed, ready for the next morning's work. This frail creature strikes her typewriter keys about 40,000 times a day, spaces 7,000 times, shifts to capitals and returns the carriage more than a thousand times each. Altogether, a few ounces at a time, she exerts more than five tons of pressure on her dainty fingertips in one day's work. And any way you look at it, women's work is not for sissies. Most men would have a hard time of it if they were to change jobs with wife, mother, or girlfriend. The homemaker walks miles every day, from sink to icebox, from cupboard to stove, and from kitchen to dining table. Let's use some very special photography to compress the whole job of preparing a meal into a few seconds of time to see how many steps it really takes to get dinner on the table. Remember, this is a hurry-up picture of just one meal out of more than a thousand. Is that what you'd call a blitz meal? Even an efficiency expert would be staggered by the amount of chasing around and indoor road work that the little woman takes as a matter of course. There's the stair climbing event, for example, usually accomplished full tilt and with an armload of brooms, mops, blankets, and sundry household paraphernalia. Here's another hurry up picture of the clinging vine whizzing through a day's program that would leave the average mountaineer gasping for breath. Each trip upstairs is the equivalent of lifting her own weight 12 feet. And at the rate of 20 trips a day, that's lifting about 12 tons of weight. Who said weaker sex? Ironing is another kind of work that's a lot of little jobs all rolled into one. Just to iron one of hubby's shirts, for instance, the iron may have to be lifted 20 or 30 times. And since a flat iron weighs about as much as a brick, a day's ironing actually uses just about as much muscle as bricklaying. Flattening a towel or wielding a trowel, even Stephen lifted 20 or Okay, you get the idea. <laughs> You get the idea. This video and its message is not the opinion of me or Ellie Publishing, okay? And we, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, what the past reveals? But hey, it is provocative. I picked it deliberately because, you know, you're going to get a reaction, aren't you? If you show this kind of thing in the class, um, of course we don't believe this now, but um, you can talk about gender politics, gender issues in the house you know who does what in the household and of course there are some terrible things that you see in old advice information films have a look online if you need some just email me they are amazing and hey we think we're so modern some of the things we're saying now on youtube or on information films could be hilarious and inappropriate 50 years from now to the future audiences so 
you know, that's how it is. Let me just get back to my um, presentation here. Uh, yeah, so provocative thought definitely going to get them talking get a reaction um, and uh, my point was really this is another way of bringing a topic to life uh, and stepping outside the course book before going back in and you know look at this women still do the majority of the housework with just seven percent of couples sharing their duties equally study finds a study of eight and a half thousand uh, couples found 93% of women do most of the chores and all of you out there are nodding or shaking your head depending on your gender uh, if in fact we are to be binary in this conversation but again it's out there it may be true it may not be true I suspect this is true and then you've got a discussion there you could do surveys the students could go home and start asking different friends asking you know pulling together information about the classroom and what they have discovered about now that's really good now there's so much there that's going on there's so many different ways that we've got them speaking because every 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 time you've done something like this shown a provocative video or looked at some provocative new facts by the way the daily mail in britain is a great paper to find stuff like this because it just is um i'm not saying it's a great newspaper i'm just saying it's a great source of inflammatory uh, opinion and facts that and there's a link there you can use for that one um, so if you think of a topic and you look on the daily mail you'll find all sorts of uh sort of spectacular sensationalist tabloid reactions and sometimes that's all it takes you just put this headline up as the kids come into the class and think of that instead of the picture and then pull out the language and you know and see where it goes that's the other thing be flexible how do we know where that lesson could go and if it really works and they're really interested I think most of you out there would agree let's keep going you know forget the rest of the lesson this is really going that they'll be really motivated for the next time that they come in I hope and maybe it'll go wrong in which case don't do this one again but uh, I hope you see that what I'm doing here is taking a regular topic housework think rooms around the house and daily chores which is in the curriculum fairly fairly low down I think in the um, in the beginner elementary levels and here's a way of making it really real and interesting now in the first two levels of sprint you've got this lovely word bank now I, I don't have time and it it wouldn't be very interesting to show you lots of pages but imagine lots of pages with different topics with these little mini dictionary things I love these because there's, there's going to be another webinar on using pictures like this and other different visuals on a webinar about using pictures in the classroom in general it's one of my favorite areas and I think for all teachers we can agree there's so many ways we can get the kids talking about pictures now here for example you could elicit from that early part of the lesson you could elicit the different chores and then maybe show some pictures without the words here you could maybe take pictures from the book or you could go to the interactive uh, digital book and and crop them you know there's lots of ways to get the pictures off the screen or the page and put them up and see if the students can identify them and put the words or one uh, idea here is you could maybe choose let's say six maybe nine maybe nine pictures from here and then hide them boom there they are gone and then the kids have to you know remember as many as they can oh there was a guy putting out plates uh, was he laying the table yeah laying the table there was somebody ironing uh, yeah so they could do a memory thing there and start to let them think about that one because you've got their attention um, you could gamify it now that's a good thing isn't it take six of the pictures from any word bank and sprint uh, level one and level two remember different topics not just uh, the chores there's all sorts of things food and transport and jobs you know the usual but you could pick six or twelve of those pictures make a little worksheet um, uh, and make some dice I mean you could make spinners uh, if you don't know how to make a spinner you could google it or you can ask me but it's like a you make a you make a spinner with card six sides put something like a matchstick without the match so safe or a stick and then you put elastic bands and spin it all right I'll show you a picture someday spinner dice and then you've got a game so you have to you know say I like and I don't like <laughs> throw a three three is washing up I don't like washing up or you could make uh, little pictures of he she it they and then they throw the dice it's a three 
maybe that's hanging out the laundry. He he hangs out the laundry. In other words, making a pronoun, personal pronoun spinner or dice, or using pictures and then using the dice to tell you which particular chore they have to do. There's one there, I think there's lists, lists of jobs. So you could throw a dice and it's a five and it's number five is all oh, the policeman. And you throw another dice and it's two and it's um, uh, loading the dishwasher. So the policeman is loading the dishwasher. It doesn't matter, you know, but that's a controlled activity where you've got, you know, a way of them not being told by you, but each telling each other in a game about the pictures. That's kind of nice. There are no dice included with the sprint course, but they are available probably in your local supermarket and they're quite cheap. So here's another example of looking at a unit and thinking, what can I do here? What's going on here? All right. So this is a, a good example from Sprint on how uh, it's called build your competences, which is really the sort of other subjects uh, and the skills we want to use with English around other subjects in English. Here we have water, water everywhere. And that comes from the expression, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. That's when you're stuck out in a lifeboat in the middle of the ocean on your own, as you do. And there's water everywhere, not a drop to drink. And there you have a text and you've got a warm up and we're thinking about different ways of using water. And that's going to move nicely through a nice little lesson plan there of some scaffolded new language. We're going to read about how much water we use. Then we're going to do some comprehension and then we're going to do some listening and then moving into speaking and writing. And that's a really nice, neat lesson plan there. And of course, with my favorite part, kids at work, where you can do some video work at home uh, to, you know, make it a bit more interesting and, and take that language further outside the classroom. But what have I done here? What I would do, this is the way I would do it, is again, I don't, I don't want to, s to see all that. that. That's just going to be overwhelming for my kids. I would do that. See the picture came from the, the top there, the top middle. Um, I'd take the picture and they, and they, and they go, what the, what's this? It's, yeah, it's a tap, all right? Uh, what's coming out the tap? Water, okay? And then brainstorm, before you show them anything here, brainstorm from the, from the students, Right. What do you? How much water do you think? You, how many different ways are there to use water at home? You know. Right, guys. You've got five minutes. Brainstorm. I wouldn't care if it was English or not at this point because I'm not trying to test their knowledge in English about water usage. That's going to come through reading about it. I want them to be activated and feel like this is an easy part of the lesson because there's going to be plenty of challenges coming anyway with the grammar and the vocab and some skills work. Just get them to see a picture and then think, brainstorm, how many different ways? And then say, right, good one. Yeah, we've got, what have we got over there? Okay, having a bath. Yeah, what about you guys? Shower, yeah, good one. Shower, writing it up on the board. Shower, uh, walk gardening, watering the plants. Yeah, so you get all the ideas and then maybe you, have a little, you get them to copy that down. Think, any more, any more? Okay, giving the dog water. Okay, and your pets. Okay, let's get the pets into one. <laughs> Not all the animals. Pets, water, great. Now we've got a list. Let's let's imagine how do we, how much water do they get the plants the dog you showering and then start to figure out before we read it because in this text they're going to read I know you can't read that right now but uh, if you get sprint you can and then you'll see there's some statistics there and again we could go outside the course and Google get the kids to I mean that's what they love doing they they Google stuff all the time ask them maybe even as a flipped classroom activity so they come in and talk about what they already know having brainstormed uh, the, the use of water in the house to then say right okay we'll go home and figure out how much people use maybe in the whole country or the whole world and that's the statistics like that are really not only shocking but thought-provoking and get kids talking so they're not sort of worried about you know their English too much they just probably I hope feel excited to to convey how shocking or spectacular the information is and that's what I mean about taking a good lesson plan like this with a nice balance of uh, text input uh, and practice and then flesh it out with the real world I took the pictures from the unit there something I like to do quite often so I'll just skip back to the unit you can see at the top there there are one two three four five pictures and I put them here oh there must be six sorry and I could make them just that could be a memory game if they see this for 30 seconds guys okay right 
Name the six pictures. Anybody? Two minutes. You. Okay. Just not me. You. Write them down quickly. And then you start to think, oh, there was a kid having a bath. There's somebody washing the food. And some people there collecting water in a country. Where could it be? And there we are, again, using visuals to get them to sort of activate the language and start to think about what we're going to do with it. And here we're talking about um, how much water we use. So there's a nice little unit there. And it's kind of practical. You know, there's a lot of conversation now, a lot of discussion out there, isn't there? Between, you know, about the environment, not wasting things, not wasting water, you know. And of course, an activity could be to present to the class in little, little mini groups ways that they could save water, you know, or presenting their facts and figures about water. So little mini presentations, but not one poor child on their own to the class. Let them work together collaborati collaboratively as a group, maybe. That would be a supportive way. I mean, like I said, I mean, speaking activities can vary. It isn't just about having a little conversation. We need to be able to present in English or we may need to be able to analyze and think in like a meeting not just having a conversation so these are the kind of study skills or even workplace skills that we are preparing our students for later there's the text you can read that at your leisure if you want to pause this and read it statistics on water usage you can argue and disagree great that's what I want if a student says to me that's not true I, I think we do more good tell me uh, tell me in English all right and there we are leading that lesson into speaking and writing imagine you're on holiday that's part six writing as an eco-friendly resort that suggests basic rules for saving water so you're not at home now you're at a resort i mean think of the wastage that goes on on holiday write an email or you could make it a mini presentation where you are what's the weather what are the steps you can do to reduce water and there is a video activity at home make a video interview with a member of your family about his daily use of drinking water and or maybe people in the neighborhood all right so again input practice and then personalizing it and globalizing the topic get them speaking there's the writing thing there and the video now you can't talk about speaking activities without mentioning drama and um, I know a lot of teachers who use drama a lot with their teenage students and young adults, not just in primary. And, and when I say a lot, it sounds like you might be thinking, well, yeah, I do drama, Andy, but some really lean on drama heavily. And I was thinking about this for, for the seminar, and there are lots of reasons. There are more than 12, in fact, but here are the 12 that generally make drama essential at various points in your class. I don't mean just doing a whole play, it could be role play, but it's fun and it's a nice release from the the day-to-day -day grind of getting through grammar and units in a course book. So how can we make drama happen in the classroom? Um, it involves the students and of course drama involves conversation and it's not just conversation but it's structured so they can lean on the lines can't they? The students can remember their lines which is memorizing English so memorizing chunks of language is is really good and it's in a context as well and they have to express themselves and you can be you know a director or the other students are directors in their little mini plays for example and you don't want them saying um, stop thief uh, this is the police <laughs> you know you want them to go stop this is the police put your hands up and lie down whatever and we want them to be expressing themselves and intonation and the rhythm patterns of pronunciation. Fantastic. It's hard to, to do that in a course book. So let the course book feed you some ideas, which we'll come to after this slide. But the context is going to be great. That's what you want. You learn some lines in a, a small play and the context will anchor that into their memories too. So it's very memorable. And by rehearsing and rehearsing, the repetition of language will, won't be boring. It'll be very welcome. And they can hear those lines again and again. And that's, that's, that's key, isn't it? Repeating language, but finding meaningful and exciting ways to do it without getting bored. Movement, senses, that's great. Using all of our senses, touch and, and, and actions and being part of uh, a scene is going to be really good for the memory and this whole kinesthetic audiovisual uh, multi-sensory approach is perfect and you're working as a group aren't you you're either in groups or you're in a whole a whole class to produce a play or whatever or a review or a show or little sketches 
Oh, maybe you've adapted sketches out of the topic, you know, that you've been doing. And that unites the class. Using drama really brings the class together um, and, and really gives them a chance to hide a little bit behind roles. I mean, when I was a teacher, even with adults, sometimes I would give them roles to play, but not, you know, role play, but roles to be. You know, you are a, an angry customer and you are a very rude shopkeeper. And you can you can see amazing things when the students can hide behind those roles, particularly if they're shy and may not really want to talk about their own life. So drama is a great way to disguise the language uh, that they can use in speaking skills, hiding behind uh, a role. And of course, it can address mixed abilities. Students then have a chance to to speak when they might not normally want to, uh, and maybe the the nature of the lines they're given, and you can you know co coordinate that they have perhaps more language to produce than they normally would be able to. So, you know, get to know drama more and try little bits. Don't, don't try and be too ambitious. Look it up and the sense of achievement is fantastic when students take part in a play or a sketch and if they perform it for an audience, that's even better. But I don't think that you have to do uh, have an audience and a show for everything you do in drama. What I'm saying is all these uh, elements here that I've listed, and there are more, really can boost the speaking skills and the confidence and the unity of your classes. So in your CPD, your continuing professional development or training or self-training, get look it up. Look up ideas for drama in English language teaching or drama in ELT or drama in English classes. There's loads of ideas out there, uh, videos as well, and uh, blogs and articles for magazines. It's really, really good uh, out there for ideas. And then just think, how could that work with my next topic? In Sprint, in the first two levels, there is a, a graded drama reader. Here we have The Wizard of Oz, and there you have a narrator and the characters and you can take your time to prepare this. This could be a, this could be just something you do as little role plays, or you could do a full-on show. You know, wonderful Wizard of Oz. There you go. How would you do the tornado scene? <laughs> they might like to do that. It could smash up the classroom. No, no, just joking. Um, there you go. So they've got scripts there. And um, you know, another thing you could do is when you look at graded readers. Um, Ellie have fantastic graded readers. Some of them are drama-based, but whenever there's a great set of dialogue in one of the readers, you can ask the students to recreate that as a script, especially if you choose one that's got a topic related to a topic. Let's say you're doing crime, and they, they pick out a Sherlock Holmes reader, and they could f identify some really good dialogue there and role-play that. That's drama, and it's speaking, and, you know, they've seen enough of those sorts of films uh, or TV shows to know what they really have to do in behavior so they can really get involved and have some fun. That's that's what we want, isn't it? Try and make some of this fun. The other graded reader uh, in level two, I think it is for Sprint, is the Canterville Ghost. So there's an old favorite there. Now I'm going to try and uh, show you a video from the Sprint course book here. Um, this is on anti-bullying, which is a, a pretty important and uh, again, thought-provoking topic. Uh, if you look at the video activities in Sprint 3, there are different ones there. I found one here from uh, Prince William uh, about his anti-bullying campaign um, with activities that can be either gap fill or speaking. What's this here? We've got gap fill here. Watch the video. This is number four. Watch the video. Read the sentences and decide if they're true or false. Well, don't worry. We don't have to do that. But what I will do is try and find the video uh, in a different screen here. and. Um, Oh look, after you watch, I think we'll learn in the video, when I play it now, why they are holding up little little cutouts of hands. Um, and the activity there would be to create your own uh, list of five people you would turn to if you're being bullied. So let's just see how I can bring that up. I go out of that provocative video. I go to my Be Smart, which is the, um, which is the digital uh, version of the book, Sprint, and I go over here and I find that I have a unit here called 
an anti-bullying prints and because it's an interactive book here and if you are unclear how to use or get your interactive book contact me or the team at the end of this webinar and we'll help you but it's a code in your book that you put into a website and uh, I'm going to show you here quickly Prince William talking about his anti-bullying campaigns here we go As a dad of two, Prince William can still get away with a casual high five. This wasn't just about connecting with the kids at this school in West London, but supporting a charity set up in his mother's name. The Diana Awards want all children to find five people they can turn to if they're in trouble. They already have 16,000 anti-bullying ambassadors in schools across the country. Like Daniel, only 11, he was picked on for three years. First of all, he'd call me a really bad name, and then he'd start punching me and kicking me, and it really wasn't nice. It, it hurt a lot. I'd, I'd usually come home with about three bruises on my shin because he was kicking me that hard. So okay. I would still do the supporting, yeah. make sure they were okay, but equally, as this young man said here, I would try and confront to re-educate where I could so it wouldn't hurt someone else. This was as much okay. a chance for the Duke to join in as learn about what's being done to help young people. In a recent survey, the charity found that 35% of pupils don't tell anyone about bullying, with 59% saying it made them think about skipping school. Millie was mainly bullied online. I bunked off school and I'd make up reasons why I didn't go in. You, you still can't escape it. It's still there. Every time you turn your phone on, every time you check you know, a certain messenger or something, there's always going to be something on there. And as much as you can use the block button, which is such a great tool, it, it doesn't quite you know, stop everything. There's always another way that they can get to you. Sharing your problems with Prince William may not feel like the most natural environment to talk about the issue of bullying, but the charity want to make sure that young people feel empowered to talk about their problems and don't just suffer in silence. The Diana Award want more pupils to join their anti-bullying programme, but say it's not about letting teachers off the hook. A lot of times teachers don't know what to do when it comes to cyberbullying, for example, or they think, oh, well, it's not happening, it's outside of school, we, can't, we don't know what to do. This time we're giving the power to young people, but also supporting teachers in making the school a safe place. There was no surprise who the prince picked as his support network. His wife, brother, father and grandparents. I want to put my dog in here as well. And his dog Lupo. But this was also his chance to again make his mark on this charity continuing his mother's legacy. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News. Right, so there you go. Prince William helping you there. <laughs> it's kind of nice to know. It's interesting to see one of his uh, one of his friends he'll talk to if he needs help with any bullying would be his his grand his grandmother, <laughs> the Queen of England. Brilliant. Uh, while we're on the subject of videos, I just want to show you another one. Uh, just a little a little part of this one, not the whole thing, but just give you an idea that uh, the there are a lot of videos in Sprint which I really like. I, that, that's also a great one to, as an example of authentic English. You know, we really want the young adults to be exposed to real authentic English as well don't we as well as the structured stuff too there are structured videos with characters in Sprint but now and again it's important that they are exposed to real English here um, there are culture videos as well and um, here there are different English speaking world topics um, if I were to go to my uh, this is interesting here if you go to the website for Ellie online and you have a code and you you can register and see the videos for yourself in the teacher resources area so it's elionline.com and you register and then you can see the students area and a teachers area and if I click on the teachers area and um, just go and have a look here I select English I look for sprint and I find it and I click on Sprint and I go to Teachers area. I log in. You can't see my password. Haha. <laughs> and then uh, I will see some of the culture videos. And this takes you actually to a direct link on the YouTube channel for Ellie, which is uh, Ellie Multimedia, I believe. So it jumps me straight onto YouTube and I can see a list of all the different cultural videos from Ellie Multimedia. There you are. Cricket. <laughs> yeah get the kids to explain cricket 
that'd be brilliant. London Transport. English is a global language, one of my favourite topics. Giants Causeway in Ireland. Here's one on California. You can see Aboriginals, Canada, Windsor Castle. Brilliant. Now look at them. They're only two or three minutes. Fantastic. Uh, here's one on California. What does that sound like? Let's have a look. California, in the southwest of the United States of America, is situated on the Pacific Ocean. It is a very long state and includes more than 1,300 kilometers of beautiful coastline. Mm. San Francisco. San Francisco was one of the small towns at the center of the gold rush. In fact, between 1848 and 1855, the number of people living here grew from only 200 to more than wow. 36,000. I've been there once, want to go back. So, uh, pfft. all right. So there's just a, a quick example of the culture videos that are on offer uh, with the uh, Sprint course. Let me just find my place. We're just going to finish now with some examples of the uh, controlled uh, practice you can do with the speaking for Sprint. Uh, but here are the, um, as I say, the culture videos, and you can go on YouTube at the LE Multimedia uh, YouTube channel and find them there, or go via the elleonline.com website. Um, a poem to remember. There's two of these, actually. They're quite sweet. You know, reciting a poem, that's a speaking activity. Can you remember any poems you, re you remembered from when you learned English? That's really nice. This one is um, the Roald Dahl one, Pure Imagination, and um, you can actually teach the students to remember that, or you can go on Spotify and find that because Gene Wilder sings it in the film uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Poetry. It's kind of drama too, isn't it? Comparing cultures, I was saying earlier that it's important that the students are exposed to culture um, and uh, different cultures and then compare it to their own. Uh, that's what we want them to do is to kind of be able to see what is going on here in, other, in, in teen life in Britain and school but how is it for you in your school and how do you what do you do for lunch and what about uniforms so these things are are important to discuss as well and get them to be thinking about other other cultures here's one on what's that regions the name of your region nationalities um stereotypes even that's a very good topic to talk about or even hear your favorite recipes or national dishes and wherever i go wherever i go and i'm very lucky to travel so much people always want to tell me about the food and how to make it so let's do this in English too. I mean you do this already but Sprint is giving you the platform and the vehicle for the the language to to present this or to discuss it. Critical thinking is a vital part of 21st century skills now so we want the kids to to examine what they're reading, reflect and evaluate the content for themselves and uh, uh, this is just a couple of examples here from the workbooks at Sprint. There's some very nice texts and here are some surveys and quizzes in the workbooks. The workbooks are not just exercises. Um, there's some really good extra texts and listenings to do uh, for the students. You can use them in the classroom. It doesn't have to be homework. There's one on uh, manners around the world. Again, cultural values. One person's bad manners is another person's totally fine. And this I thought was fantastic. This is an article, you know, it's in the workbook and so many teachers just, just give the workbook out as extra. But this is a fantastic text about uh, a guy called Daniel Kish who's very famous. There are some TED Talks by him and a couple of videos on how he uses clicks in his mouth. He's blind and he uses clicks to as like a sonar device, like, like, like a bat that uses sound to determine... Um, where things are and where he is and actually if you look online there are some videos which I've taken some clips there some little pictures to show Daniel talks about this on YouTube in different ways and documentaries so again an example there of finding a text at Sprint it's great it's very informative and then or before get the kids to maybe talk about it or even find the video talk about the video or do their own commentary you could find a video there I've got one here. Quickly, let's do this. Let's find, let's find Daniel. I did have this earlier. There he is. Here's Daniel talking about his life, clicking for sound to see where he is. And now we know by watching our students and by uh, bat research and dolphin research 
We know that echolocating with the environment using active signals such as clicking is an interactive process. Okay, just a process. very quick glimpse there. You, you know videos are so powerful and a great way to motivate the students to talk. How would they talk here? Well, they could discuss what they see. This is a, uh, well, it's quite a long documentary, so I would keep it quite short, two or three minutes maybe. And uh, maybe they could choose their own parts of it and do their own commentary. Or, as you know on YouTube, you can see the the captions and the script, get the script printed out and get them to maybe read out their commentary or do their own. So there are lots of ways to really uh, get the kids speaking on, on videos related to the topics that you find even in the workbook. And I say even because a workbook is so often reduced to just a series of homework exercises, but it, it can be much more than that. And if you are interested in using film more in the classroom uh, beyond the usual activities that most people know about, contact me. There are so many free resources out there on using film to supplement your topic, to boost grammar, and I mean real videos that you can use and bring those lessons to life and in this particular context to get a reaction to get the kids talking. Okay, so we've done videos, we've done uh, a little bit of culture, we've done uh, ways to exploit the workbooks and the course book, and I just want to finish here by saying, you know, it's important that we keep pronunciation, you know, as parallel to our speaking activities. There's no point speaking if you don't pronounce correctly. So Sprint will address in every unit elements of pronunciation. Look at that. What was that? That one there. That's the third person S. So is it speaks, or is it with a s, or is it remembers with a z, or is it uses with an is? So that's a that's a popular one, isn't it? And there's another popular one. Different past simples touched borrowed d or fainted so there we have a listening and the students have to listen and then yeah you've seen this but it's important that those things do happen in the unit alongside any speaking activity as well pronunciation is like I think the fifth skill uh, in many ways or part B of speaking which is all about fluency usually uh, if you're interested in pronunciation I, I highly recommend you look at uh, Mark Hancock's website uh, with all sorts of articles and resources on teaching pronunciation and I mention this because I think pronunciation is an, is an area where it's often left in the background and you know teachers can be afraid of it for all sorts of reasons but it's a vital element of uh, teaching English and for, if you are feeling a little bit guilty right now don't feel guilty just get to know more resources like these uh, and use the pronunciation activities in books like Sprint. Sprint will give you guided dialogues as well. So, for example, here, instead of just letting the students make up a dialogue as pair work, this is very specific here. On the left, Harriet and William asks William if he has ever been abroad. William replies yes. Harriet asks where. William replies to Australia and New Zealand. So here they have to sort of look at this in the book and come up with a more natural dialogue based on these very careful prompts. And there's another one there on the right hand side. Um, structured dialogues. Again, it's controlled, but maybe that's what we need at the beginning. And then we can move to freer practice here. This is often in exams, isn't it? Some of the Cambridge exams. You have to talk about pictures. So Sprint gives pictures to talk about purely for speaking practice and then maybe you could you know get the students to bring in maybe copies if not their real phone to talk about their pictures in the topic you've been talking about. Let's go back to the chores. Take po photographs of you doing the chores or video and talk about it. All right. So we're doing everything we can to bring the students own real world into the classroom and let them feel that speaking is not just an activity to to do in the class because you're a teacher but because we want them to feel engaged and involved doing it. So that's all I can really tell you today about speaking skills with teens and young adults and the key thing is to really make them curious, keep them involved, structure it, uh, let them prepare and go from control to more freer practice but personalize it and globalize it as much as possible and Sprint is a really thorough course to, to do that. So again, you can drop me a line if you want to ask me for any links or query anything, andy at eltconnections.com or contact your local representative from LE at international at leonline.com. Follow them on social media. I'll be back soon with another webinar and thank you for joining me.